straight to the roots. Where is the busiest? Because by gosh, these airports are busy. Yeah, the probably on the network, the United Kingdom is the strongest at the moment. Uh, partly driven by the fact that we're not into China as much as we were prior to the pandemic, simply because they haven't allowed us to go back in again. But it really is a very robust story of demand for all our flights. Uh, UK is strongest, but marginally. Europe is very strong. America is very strong. So, Are we booming in business class, or is it the leisure traveler still that is booming in business class? Well, I think you've got to be a little bit careful of how you define the premium cabin. I, I've always thought it was a bit of a misnomer calling it business class, because it presupposes everybody in there was a business person. Yep. Well, they're not. And as the uh, as disposable incomes, discretionary incomes have uh, uh, grown over the last 20 or 30 years, so the premium cabins have been populated by a multiple uh, set of segments, not just business. So you mentioned leisure, mm -hmm. uh, vi visiting friends and family, uh, a mixture of leisure and business. So it's uh, it's a different story altogether, really. There is a narrative at the moment that there's this quasi exit Britain, young people coming to Dubai, commuters of mm. banking and finance. Is there a change in the complexion of the booking patterns in the London-Dubai routes? Well, the, look, the, it's a very strong route and it is clear that Dubai uh, offers an awful lot of opportunities and attractions to people at the start of their careers, mid-careers, whatever. You mentioned some of the uh, segments that are growing at pace banking, law, uh, media, real estate, uh, travel, etc. Um, so I think a lot of a lot of people have, are looking at Dubai. It's caught their eyes, and they're starting to move down here and live down here. Uh, so that the the old inhibitions or restrictors, such as visas and residence permits, have all been removed. So now you can come here and work and live here, and and uh, generally enjoy things. I thought I think that's starting to look quite as a serious proposition for the European uh, populations as well as the UK. Well, here's the thing about mm. pricing, because I've just booked, you'd be glad to know, I'm, I'm brand loyal, I've just booked a couple of flights, but they're, they're pretty pricey. Do I need to tacitly accept that the age of cheap flights is over and that prices are going to stay high for longer? Well, it's anybody's guess. My own view is that you'll get a settling in the various segments, such as uh, uh, economy, I'm not sure about first and business, as you, we call it, premium, the premium cabins, yep. because demand remains really, really strong. At one point out of the UK, out of London, for every business class seat we sold, there were four or five people trying to get it. Uh, so the prices were then higher. And do I see that changing over time? It'll come off a little bit. The airline community is not in a position to mount the same kind of capacity it had prior to the pandemic. Um, and so, and a lot has changed as a result of the pandemic. For the, one of the reasons we talked about was what's happening in Dubai and people coming here. So, in the in the long run, shortage of capacity, i.e., supply, demand being as strong as it is, prices are probably going to be higher than certainly were before the pandemic. No sign of a fade in the booking in the back half of the year. People are talking about a mild recession coming. Prices will tighten up a little bit. Any evidence in the booking no, pattern? No. Absolutely no, nothing. Nothing at all. So the other proposition is this, is you've got the restriction in terms of adding capacity, but isn't the truth that climate costs in Europe have quadrupled since 2019, and if we want to fly, we're going to have to pay more because of CO2 emissions. There, there, there is, that, that's coming down the track at pace now. I've just read that the European Union is insisting that 40% of European aviation fuel uplift by 2040 is uh, SAF fueled. To get there, to get those kind of quantums, given what we burn today as an industry, uh, a lot has got to happen. A lot of money has got to be spent, and that money will eventually, the cost will, will work its way through into the pricing structures of the, of the business. So yes, people are going to have to pay a little bit more in the sustainability sort of theatre, if you like. Will sustainability aviation fuel come more quickly than we anticipate? I don't think so, no. I'd, I'd, <laughs> I, I, I'd love to think it would, but when you're converting biomass, repurposing refineries, building new refineries, the, the investment that's got to go into that has got to come from somewhere. I don't see much evidence of that at the moment. You talk about the constriction or the, the inability to return capacity to where we were, and that brings me to your, your orders. No new planes through 2024 was the last sort of update that I had. When do you get these A350s and the 787s? When? August next year. 
Absolutely 100%. Uh, well, OK, you know, I, I'm not producing them, but <laughs> August of next year, with a compressed delivery programme for 50 in two and a half years, uh, the 777 9s come up in uh, the summer of 25, give or take a few months. And then there is 115 of them coming down the track, as long as Boeing can step up to the, uh, the uh, delivery schedules that we Does need. Does that transform Emirates? It doesn't transform it. It gives us a big uh, boost in our production capability. And don't forget, we've actually extended the lives of our, many of our aircraft, mm -hmm. the 777 and of course the 380s, simply because the 777-9 is five and a half years late. So we need these aeroplanes in as quickly as possible. All the A380 beauties back in the sky, or are we still got a few idle? Uh, we have about 20 that are idle, waiting for technical remediation. They've been in the desert for about two or three years yep. now. They need a lot of work to get them flying again. 777X, Baccarol Bacco yesterday said, uh, regulators are too rigid. What do you say to that? I don't think regulators can be rigid enough, frankly. Um, we, the, the, the manufacturers have, I, mean, I, I don't want to be disingenuous to the work that they've done, but in the pursuit of fuel economy, the pursuit of lightening up aircraft, in the pursuit of mm -hmm. trying to get the unit cost of production down, I think they've, certain corners might have been cut or they've moved a fast track uh, of processes to get the job done. Now that invariably, if you're not careful, will compromise your engineering qualities, your design, your quality gate, your quality assurance, both into factory and out of factory. You've got to keep a very careful eye on all of that. Do you need to take action now to order more to try and get ahead of the backlogs that you've dealt with in the past couple of years? We will probably order more in the next few months on top of what we already have. Size and number? Uh, no, I'll just keep that as it is for the moment, but I mean, it's, it's coming along. Um, so, it, There are now four. There's going to be four major carriers in our region. Etihad, yourselves, Qatar. And Tony Douglas has taken the plunge to Saudi Arabia. Do we need four? Is there space for four? Will you all eat at the same table? Well, I don't know. Uh, look, Saudi is a story in itself. Saudi is reckoning that by 2030 it'll take 100 million visitors into the kingdom. That's in six and a half years. Base, on base zero, maybe 500,000, mm -hmm. 2 million. I don't know what it is. Imagine that. So if they're going to achieve that, that Tony's going to have his work cut out, as will Neom, as will Saudi. Good luck to them is what I say. And of course the spend behind that, you're talking about two and a half trillion dollars of spend in the kingdom, that's going to suck in huge amount of ec and create economic activity in the area. I'm not bothered about it. Not bothered about Saudi Arabia. Are they not going to pull away some of the staff from you? Is that not a risk? Oh, that's that actually that's quite a, 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 a what a, can I say a current topic in the in the uh, <laughs> and of course it is to the stable of Emirates that they they come because you've got all the thoroughbreds in there. You see, so Ooh. a lot of our uh, a lot of our staff have been seduced by whatever's going on over there. It's a pity, um, but we're kind of used to it. When the other carriers grew, they tended yep. to do the same thing. Alan Joyce stepped down mm. in the past 24 hours, which brings me to the moment. Is it time to talk to you about hanging up your wings and give us the, the succession plan? When you see a moment like that, Joyce going, does it spur you to say, I'm ready, Manus, I'm ready to go? Yeah, I think um, I just on Alan Joyce, he and I were competing as to who's going to go first, and he won today <laughs> when I read about it. Um, now, he had the same view as I did. I, I wanted to get the business back into, yep. into profit, get the cash uh, into good shape, get the balance sheet back to where it was, and then take the business on so I could step back and, and leave it. That is happening as I speak. We've, we've just completed the best year we've ever had. Yep. Um, we are looking towards a, a very good year coming up. I've got a great team of people who work with me. So it's a question of when the shareholder says, right, Tim. But will it be an external hire like Joyce or will it be an internal? It'll be a shareholder decision. The government of Dubai will make that decision, not me. So that's an easy one for me to answer, by the way.